ever gone to a church outside of the tradition that you're used to, you may have been surprised by the different patterns that they follow. Maybe the clothes were different or priorities within the service or the way things are read or delivered. And most likely, the way they worship is different from what you're used to. Do these ceremonies and rituals really matter? Well, today on Through the Bible, we're examining these exact issues in our study of Zechariah chapter 6. Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, has a lot to say about how we approach God. In fact, he has a three-part answer to the question of ritual. And when it's all said and done, Dr. McGee would agree that the critical issue is not order of service or priorities of disciplines, but rather the state of your heart. Has it been transformed by the Holy Spirit? Are you a new creature? So before we get to our study, let's hear a letter from a listener who has been changed by the study of God's Word. It comes from a friend who listens to Through the Bible in the Gondi language in India. I am a regular on the Bible bus because it gives me joy and peace and helps me understand the Word of God. I once belonged to a different faith, and like the rest of my family, I used to perform all the rituals that keep the gods happy and be blessed by them. But when my friend told me about Christ, something inside me felt different. Then I started listening to this program and accepted Christ as my Savior. I went through many problems with my family, but God was with me and your program too. Please pray for them. Yes, it's our privilege to pray for the spiritual lives of people around the world, as well as the salvation of their family members. So when Dr. McGee was alive, he not only asked the passengers of the Bible bus to pray for the effectiveness of the broadcast around the world, he demanded it. And that led us years ago to begin the tradition of distributing a world prayer guide to anyone who would agree to pray for the impact of Through the Bible. Would you pray with us? Let us know that you'd like to receive our world prayer guide with a map and pictures of our worldwide team of producers, and we'll mail it to you right away. To get your prayer guide, email BibleBus at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's 1-800-652-4253. Or drop us a note at Through the Bible, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now let's commit our study to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your wisdom and knowledge as your word penetrates our hearts and minds. We turn our attention to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our friends, last time we got down to the 15th verse, which is the last verse of the 6th chapter, and we saw that there had come this delegation down from Babylon, and they had come with some crowns that they had made. And the message that was given at that time by the Lord was to make it very clear that All that they did when they crowned Joshua, he was the high priest. And it was symbolic, and it was looking forward to the time when the one who's called the branch, whose name is the branch. Now, may I say that the Word of God speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ as the branch in a fourfold way. For instance, you have over in Isaiah, the fourth chapter, the second verse, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And so you have there the one that's presented as the branch of Jehovah. And then you find out that he is also called the branch of David. That's over in the 11th chapter of Isaiah, and a stem out of Jesse. 
And then you find also that he's spoken of as Jehovah's servant, the branch. And we've already seen that here in Zechariah in the third chapter, the eighth verse. And in that you have his humiliation and obedience unto death. And then in Zechariah, in this passage that we are looking at here, he's called the man whose name is the branch. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, you have him as the branch of David. He is in the line of David. In the Gospel of Mark, he is Jehovah's servant, the branch. And in the Gospel of Luke, he's the man whose name is the branch. And in the Gospel of John, he's the branch of Jehovah. And that is a marvelous and glorious picture of him and the picture that we have here. It's the man whose name is the branch. He's the one that's going to rule and reign. He'll build a millennial temple, we're told here. He shall build the temple of the Lord, and he'll be a priest upon his throne. We emphasized that last time. And the crowns, verse 14, shall be to heal him, and so on. These crowns were to be a memorial. We're told that here, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they were put in the upper windows, and they were to remind the people that God would send the Messiah, and he would not only be the king, but he would be the priest. And now verse 15 says, And they that are far off shall come, and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord. Now, the message for these people, of course, is a message of encouragement. Zacharias encouraged them to build the temple. He and Haggai both was trying to overcome their discouragement and all of the hurdles that they had to get over and now he encourages them to build. Why? Because this little segment that seems to them so small, it fits in to God's plan and program of the ages that will finally bring the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth as the Messiah, as the branch to rule. And so what you have here, I consider a tremendous, wonderful picture and it reveals Christ in all of his glory, the second coming of Christ. And what they were doing was in the plan and program of God. And he would be a priest king and would serve in the millennial temple. And in verse 15, he's saying to them this, the temple that you are building now is not an end in itself. It points on to the coming of the branch, of the Messiah, of the Christ, of the Redeemer. In other words, this is the hope that was given to them. Now, take a look at that little group building the temple. And they were going to get help from afar. But actually, as you look at it, it's not impressive. But when you see it in the plan and purpose of God and in the sweep of history, it points on to Christ. And may I now make this comment. Any Christian work that's an end in itself is doomed. It may be a cathedral on the boulevard that's named for some man. Or it may be a great building named for a man who's very generous. Or a college that exalts a man. I know of a Christian college that's got names of men on practically every building that's on the campus exalting man, and even a mission that just honors a man is doomed. And my friend, let's be very personal, a radio program that is for the profit of a man and for his exaltation, all of these are doomed. They're going to go down in ignominy and defeat. They must honor the branch because God is moving to that day when he's going to reign moving to that day when he'll first take his own out of this earth, the church. And then he'll be coming to the earth to establish his kingdom here upon the earth. So that today, we can bring it right down to today, 
That little group of believers on a back street that's meeting in the name of Christ, seeking to honor him and studying his word, and they really want to do his will. And I think that, very frankly, they can truly sing to the glory of God. Lord Jesus, I love you. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. May I say to you, that little group that's unknown to the world that's meeting out somewhere today on the back street or up in some rural community is more important in the plan of God than anything that's happening in Washington or the capitals of the world today. And I know that that's hard for a great many people to believe. But that little group are in a plan and program that's going to join in a mighty chorus someday when they sung a new song and it's in heaven. And they're going to sing it to the Lamb. And they say to him, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation. And hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests. We shall reign on the earth. That's the goal toward which they're moving. And so that little group, that the world is ignoring today and the multitudes that pass them by, they are more important to the plan and purpose of God than any other group on this earth. May I say to you, this is a tremendous passage of Scripture and what a message it has for us today. Now that brings us to the conclusion of the first major division of Zechariah. Now, in chapters 7 and 8, we have what I've labeled a historic interlude, and it's very similar to what we had in the little prophecy of Haggai. You'll recall that in the middle of that prophecy that this man Haggai was sent to the priests to ask concerning a law, a law concerning cleansing, anything that is ceremonially clean when it touches that which is unclean, will it make it clean? And of course it won't. And that which is ceremonially unclean, if it touches that which is clean, will it make it unclean? And the answer is yes, it will. Now, in this historic interlude, we have the same problem approach from a little different angle. And I think that the important thing now is to get this before us. So let me read here in chapter 7 at verse 1 of Zechariah, and I'll read several verses. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Shishlu. All right, the impressive thing here is that, again, he's going to have a message for these people and it's going to be a very important message. And he makes it clear it's not his own message, but it's the word of the Lord. And it was in the fourth year of the king Darius, and it was the ninth month of Cheslev, and it was the fourth day. And if you want me to bring it right down to our calendar, that was December the 4th, 518. Now, you recognize it was during that same period that Haggai was speaking to the people in a very practical way. Now, will you notice what the problem is? It says, when they had sent unto the house of God Sherezer and Regimelech and their men to pray before the Lord and to speak unto the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month separating myself as I have done these so many years. All right, now this is what is before us. And when it says here, when they had sent unto the house of God. Now, actually, this delegation had originally been in Babylon. These are Babylonian names. And I have put in my notes that it's a delegation had come to Jerusalem from Babylon. Actually, 
when it says here that they were in the house of the Lord, these men were sent unto the house of God. They actually came from Bethel. Now, Bethel means, you remember, the house of God. It was old Jacob that named it. And it was the place, as he said that night when God appeared to him, he says, this is the very door of heaven. This is the temple or the house of God. He thought he'd run away from God, but he hadn't. Now, these people have come down from Bethel. Bethel was in the northern kingdom. It was actually in the area that the ten tribes were. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you think that these people were that came down? Do you think they were of the tribe of Judah? Well, may I say to you, they were not of the tribe of Judah. They probably were of the tribe either of Benjamin or Ephraim, probably of Ephraim. And if you go back to the book of Ezra, which I'll not do today, because we've already been over that book and I called attention to it at the time, you will find that many people who returned from the captivity went back to towns some of them are way up in the north of the Sea of Galilee and in that area. Now, all of that belonged to the ten tribes that constituted the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, when anybody says they are the ten lost tribes, may I say to you, you need to really examine the Scripture rather carefully because those that return would naturally go back to where they came from. And many went to the northern part, that was the kingdom of Israel. They happened to be folk born in the Babylonian captivity that are now returning as Jews back to their own tribe. And there's no 10 lost tribes. So if you feel like that England or the United States happened to make up the 10 lost tribes, may I say to you, you are very much lost in the maze of Scripture because they are not lost, but you are. Because actually, they were not lost, and that makes this a very important passage of Scripture because they here actually refers to a man who came down from Bethel, the place called the house of God. Now they've come down with a question. In fact, you have here a question that Zechariah gives a threefold answer to, and it has to do with a ritual. Is a ritual right or is a ritual wrong? That is the question that they ask, and the picture is just simply this. You see, they had come down from the north, and they had been into captivity, and they had set aside days of fasting and days of weeping and mourning, and they had continued that after the captivity, and God was not blessing them. Oh, there was a certain amount of prosperity had come. Many of them were building their homes, and they were getting very comfortable, and some of them affluent, and yet they go and weep and mourn, and they say, we've been doing that, and God hasn't blessed us. What about it? What about a ritual? That's the question that is here. Actually, the right and wrong of a ritual. And this is an important question. And I'll tell you why it's an important question. Because today, we're seeing a recrudescence of ritualistic religion. There's a movement toward formalism, adopting a ritual. And it's always in evidence when people cease to think, when they get away from the person of Christ. Then they start either getting up and down or marching around. They have to start doing something. And it is a time of spiritual decline. It was a time when they fought over the prayer book in Europe, as if that was important, whether you should stand up or sit down or kneel, or how should you do it? And then there are many people today that want a liturgy or an elaborate ritual. And there are religions that are called Christian religions that are ritualistic. Some are liturgical. And even those of us that are nonconformists, 
that come from out of the Reformation, we say a ritual is repugnant. We despise the ritual. We see in it evil continually. But even in our services, we have a certain amount of it. We open with a doxology, and everybody stands up for that. And we close with the benediction, and somewhere between there's an offering and a sermon. Now, what is the value of a ritual? God gave to the nation Israel a religion. That's the only religion he ever gave. And it was ritualistic. It was loaded with ritual. And the question arises, is a ritual right or is a ritual wrong? And that's the question of these people. They said, we've been going through the ritual, we've been weeping, we've been carrying on, and should we continue to practice it? Now, Zechariah is going to answer their question. He's the prophet of the remnant. He is encouraging them. Most of Israel, both the northern and southern tribes, had not returned. And they were doing well and prospering, and they also had the same question. They were going through that. And so God has an answer. And the very interesting thing is that God's answer is also a message from God. Now, I'm just going to get down to that answer, and then we'll deal with it next time. Here it is, verses 4 and 5. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, that would be August and October, even those 70 years, that is, when they were in captivity, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye did eat and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? God says, really, when you went through your ritual, did you do it for me? And did you do it to honor me and to praise me? Or did you do it as a legalistic sort of an exercise that you thought would build up on the credit side something that would make you acceptable to me and cause me to bless you? Well, to begin with, God never had given to them any ritual that had weeping in it and fasting. Did you know that God never gave to his people fast days? He gave to his people feast days. Gave them seven feast days. Now the question is, are these wrong? Well, we're going to have a threefold answer. Let me give it to you, and then we'll deal with it next time. Number one, he'll deal with it here, when the heart is right, the ritual is right. The second answer is, when the heart is wrong, the ritual is wrong. And the third part of the answer is, and we'll get that in chapter 8, God's purpose concerning Jerusalem is unchanged by any ritual. And that's true today. A great many people think a ritual is so important. My friend, the important thing is the heart. It's not the ritual that you go through. That has to do with a lot of head knowledge. But what about the heart? Now, we want to talk about that next time, and I have two letters. I hoped I'd be able to get down to read them today, but I haven't been able to. But next time, I intend to read those two letters, and I think they might open the eyes of some folk. I trust that they will. So tomorrow, or next time, we're going to deal with this very important section we've come to. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, tomorrow, Dr. McGee will read those two letters that he mentioned. And in addition, we'll begin our study with another letter, one that Dr. McGee said is a favorite. It's from a great senior citizen who said his eyes were opened to what the Bible really says. And of course, in Dr. McGee's tradition, we continue to read letters from folks on the Bible bus whose lives have been changed by the Word of God. So what's your story? Will you write and maybe tell us how you've been impacted by the Word of God taught on through the Bible? 
because we'd love to hear your story. And we'd love to see your Bible bus pictures as well. Don't forget that. Have you sent yours in? Just snap a picture of yourself. You can hold a sign up. That's what we normally have people do that says how long you've been riding the Bible bus and then from where you listen. And then email it to us at biblebus at ttb.org. And remember, you can always check out all the happy faces on the Bible bus on our website, ttb.org forward slash Bible bus. And on the back page of our monthly newsletter as well. And speaking of it, if you'd like to receive our monthly newsletter, and remember it's full of praise reports and prayer needs, additional teaching from Dr. McGee, as well as Bible study resources, just let us know. We'd be happy to send it to anyone, but only when they request it. Give us a call at 1-800-65-BIBLE or sign up at ttb.org. Well, that's all for now. God bless you today as you walk with Him. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. This program's been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.